I'm like a fucking God. You know what I mean? Like I'm in a human suit, but nothing makes me scared. Nobody and nothing that anybody does really can affect me. And part of that, I think, is sort of overcoming that fear of dying. Mm. I lived that first decade of my adulthood in like this box, literally like a box, like, oh my God, I have to do all these things. I'm gonna die. When in fact, it should have been the opposite. I'm not gonna die. And that's what changed when it came back when I was 30. When the doctor said to me, ah, oh, geez, even if you do everything we say, 18 months, maybe two years. And I literally looked at them and said, fuck you, <laughs> that is not happening. Rebecca Housel, PhD, is a 28-year survivor of high-grade brain cancer and an author and editor in the Mental Health for Millennials series. She's a former award-winning professor in both Greater Atlanta and Upstate New York and has served on editorial advisory boards for multiple academic journals. She's also known as the Pop Culture Professor and did a three-year North American tour with Comic-Con. An author and editor in the New York Times best-selling philosophy and pop culture series, Rebecca's books are sold in nine languages and over 90 countries. In this interview, we discuss a number of topics with Rebecca, including how, since her second diagnosis of cancer, she now lives fearlessly and without a fear of dying, the life challenges that led her to being able to live a life in this way, and how a lack of fear of death stops her from living inside a box anyone else defines for her. She also discusses the influence of pop culture on our perceptions of death. Please support the show by liking and sharing this episode on social media. And to make sure that you don't miss out on any future episodes, please sign up for our newsletter at deathhangout.com. It would also be a massive help to us if you could subscribe to our YouTube channel, which you can do right now by simply clicking on the subscribe button. So now get ready for this episode, Living Without Fear of Death. When I was, I was telling you boys that when I was 19, I was diagnosed with this really high grade brain cancer. You know, the prognosis is, was like five to 10 years. So I lived extremely fully during that time, but in like a lot of fear because I had a child. I had a child when I was 17. I, I did not grow up in like pastoral America suburbs, the things that people imagine that wasn't my childhood. It was kind of hard. So I had a child already when I was 17, you know, so I was like terrified of dying before my son was like 18 years old. So when it came back 10 years later, and he was now, I think almost 12, I changed everything. Instead of being afraid of death, like that was like, oh, I got to do all this stuff before I die. It was more like, I need to live for me <laughs> because this label that doctors put on me drove all this weird fear-driven behavior. In fact, I was in Red Book Magazine because I, was, I would buy like three or four years worth of Christmas gifts after the first diagnosis for my son because I was afraid I wouldn't be there. Like really kind of pathological behavior that I just felt like the, after the second time, I was like, you know what? fuck it. I just don't care anymore. I'm just going to live my life for me. It's been now, they gave me two years to live. It's been 18 since then. And it has been absolutely the best. The last decade has been the best of my life. The most full, the absolute best. Because when I kind of reached 40, I was like, wow, I was waiting for cancer to come back. Like every decade, it seemed to come back. And I was like, oh, it's, it didn't come back. Fan-fucking-tastic. I'm going to go and do like everything and everybody. And we can maybe edit that last part out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. We're, we're good. But I, I, I love what you said, living my life. So you, you, you had, I don't know, is it a realization? Like living my life. And what does it mean to live your life? It seems that you have accepted something that, or, that's you know. right you're right so because i had had a child so young i didn't feel my life was my own or that i even had a right to live outside of the expectations i wanted him to grow up 
and adopt, like going to college. So I, you know, when you're 17, you haven't gone to college. So I went to college and I got my bachelor as my master's, my doctor, and I just kept going. I'm like, well, I want to leave a legacy, you know, not just like existing in some selfies, you know, like I want to actually do something. So I began writing books and teaching college students. And I, I started like scholarships and I was doing all these really good things, but none of it was for me. It was all for my son's benefit to some degree. And so after that second time around, and it did take good I would say five to seven years. And then I waited until the 40th birthday, until 10 years after that recurrence happened to like sort of be like, okay, now I can really be myself. <laughs> I began wearing like clothes that were more me, you know, instead of wearing the LL Bean, the typical American turtlenecks and wide wheel corduroys, because I was a mom. I wanted to um, portray that image for my son since I was so young. When I had him, I didn't want him to ever feel like I like had even gained weight. I ugly myself up completely. And then when I turned 40, and at that point, he was, was he like 25 years old? He was old, you know, he was like already pretty old, 24 maybe. He was an adult really. So I was like, hey, I can finally live for myself. I don't have cancer. I don't have a kid. I can, I can go. Yeah. What's, what's shifted for you? Because you said a lot of that stuff you were doing was all legacy stuff, that whole wanting to be remembered. So what, what shifted for you on that? What made you, you said it was all for other people. So suddenly what I was getting from that is it, that wasn't fulfilling you so much. So what was the shift there? When you're living for death, because death is coming, it's imminent. It's happening any day. It's not like a hundred year punch pass. For me, it was five or 10 years when I was only 19 years old. My entire life was about how to protect my son, how to live a life that I felt he could look to and emulate and be proud of if something did happen to me. I did good things for myself and for him and for other people, but it definitely, it wasn't, it wasn't done for, for me, for my own benefit. It wasn't, I wasn't living for myself at all. What was the, the, the lack of fulfillment per se in that? When you have a child very young, when you're a child and you have a child, you don't get to have like all of the things that you would do in your 20s and even 30s for many people. I did not get to do. I wasn't living for me ever. I, I started my adult life as a child. Like I was still a child when I started living like an adult. I never had any of the experiences that young adults have that builds your foundation and mm. helps you to understand yourself better because death was my constant companion during that decade for about a decade and a half of my adult life because death is sitting next to me or something you know because of labels that doctors gave me applied to me and I allowed but that's that's really the whole point of my survive anything from psychology today that whole column is about basically freeing yourself from those boxes that people build mm. for you the social boxes before you're even born they build them for you when you die you can live in a box you know when you're alive <laughs> you should you should strive like to be box free <laughs> for us that's actually what we what we think with 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 kids death can be so i don't know if it's a companion but can be a tool to mm. get out of this box it's just to say yes. oh shit shit, I don't want to be in this box because suddenly <laughs> it, does, it doesn't It does make sense to be there. And no. for us, it's just, just this like a, kind of a death as an extractor to say, hey, look, look, do you want that? Do you really want to be like this, to live like that? So is it, it what happened to you? And I'm curious, is, is death still a com companion to you? Is it something different to you now? It's definitely, it was certainly, and it is still, I mean, it's a, it's a process, you know, it's like an evolutionary process. I still, I still am working toward fulfillment, but I can say with total like happiness and joy, <laughs> I have done a lot of the things that I had never gotten to do that have given me some kind of personal fulfillment. And I will not be sharing what those things are. Really? Why not? <laughs> because... You know, they may be sexual in nature. <laughs> That's they okay. We are, we, a little we are R rated. <laughs> you, would, you would really have to be X rated for these stories. <laughs> okay. No it, was li it was liberating in every way. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, I am super happy and I continue to like travel and meet people and 
And traveling independently as a woman is like something that maybe that's part of this actually, now that I think about it. I just am fearless. I really am fearless. I was in Ireland for a month recently, but while I was there, of course, I, I end up breaking a leg and a foot and I won't tell you how that happened. Really? I, Again? <laughs> there's a lot of censored material here. I, I, let's just say I would like to not be known. I want to be known for my intellectual prowess, yes. not for any other kind of prowess, although that does exist, obviously. But I feel like, you know, as a woman alone, I'm in a foreign country. I'm in the emergency room for like five hours and I wasn't afraid. I, I wasn't worried at all. I. I really do feel this way. And like this most recent experience kind of proved it to me even more. I'm like, I'm like a fucking God. You know what I mean? Like I'm in a human suit, but nothing makes me scared. Nobody and nothing that anybody does really can affect me. And part of that, I think, is sort of overcoming that fear of dying, mm -hmm. you know, of like mm -hmm. imminent death. I lived that first decade of my adulthood in like this box, literally like a box, like, oh my God, I have to do all these things. I'm gonna die. How terrible, what a, like a horrible psychology, when in fact it should have been the opposite. I'm not gonna die. And that's what changed when it came back when I was 30, 10 years or 10 plus years after the first diagnosis. I just decided when the doctor said to me, oh, geez, even if you do everything we say, 18 months, maybe two years. And I literally looked at them and said, fuck you. <laughs> that is not happening. I have worked way too hard to let some stupid disease take my life. That is not happening. So I, I just started living for myself. And I didn't even do what they told me to do. I mean, I did some of the prescribed treatments, you know, I'm a doctor. I'm like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to research this myself and decide for myself, not based on liability clauses that hospital legal counsels came up with so that doctors who just have jobs, by the way, they're just guys with jobs or ladies with jobs, you know, but because they're dealing with a vulnerable population, I mean, you know, when you're told you have cancer and you're going to die in two years, usually the response is, I'll do whatever you say. But that's living, again, for death, not living mm. for yourself. So I flipped things on, on death and myself at that time. And it took, like, like I said, about five to seven years. And then I kind of realized I was in the clear, you know, no matter what happens. I, I've done it, you know, like I'm victorious. <laughs> I, I really felt like I had won like the lottery in a way. And I thought, you know, I don't have the money to like go run around the world, but I can find a few thousand dollars every year and just go travel somewhere every year or do something for someone that I really am interested in. It's fascinating because I think the point that we're trying to make in, 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 in what we're doing is it's, it's, it's trying to help make that shift into that, yeah. feel, that fearless place. So what were the what were the, what were the fundamental shifts for you? How do you articulate? As you said, you weren't that fear disappeared. How can you try and articulate what that is like to live? What shifted for you? And if any of your listeners, I'm sure this is highly relatable, has ever reached rock bottom, you know whether you know. But for most people, it's like losing a house, losing a job, or some kind of major loss occurs for them and you're like, you feel like you're at the bottom, there's only one way to go from there. And, and after 10 years of living in basically a prison of death, you know, a fear of death, I, I just decided, you know what? They say I'm gonna die now no matter what, absolutely not gonna happen. You know, I, I get to decide. That's really who I am. It's always been who I am. Because when I, of course, got pregnant at 17, you can imagine, and I didn't, my family abandoned me. You can imagine that it was really me. Everybody was like, oh, you'll never go to college. You'll never have a good job. You'll never ha make anything of yourself. And it was another one of those moments. And that's just a personality thing where I was like, you know what? Fuck you all. I don't believe in abortion, right? You know what I mean? Like, not, I believe in choice. But for me at that moment in time, I, would, I just was not up for that. Uh, yeah. procedure um, and adoption because I had had kind of a crappy childhood. I didn't want to then adopt out a baby to a, 
uh, to people that I, I thought were, I was pretty certain were going to be abusive at some point. However, I did know the one variable I could kind of like count on was myself. I was like, you know, I know I'm not going to do anything shitty to this kid. I'm only going to like help raise him up, make him, make him better. You know what I mean? Give him the things I didn't have. And that's really what I did. I just, that was, you know, so like, I guess twice in my life, I sort of said, fuck you to the social boxes that people applied. And I just think it's hitting rock bottom. It's really the moment that a lot of people need to be able to say, you know, no, I'm not going to die. I'm not going to live this way. I'm, I'm going to live my way. You know, when you mentioned people losing their house, losing their job, losing, and you know, for us, I think it's what we call these little deaths, actually, because it is, is losing something which is important. It's kind of dying. And you mentioned this, something which is the resilience in you to say, well, fuck you all. You know, I, 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 can, I right. can rise. I can rise. You know, for us, the point that we're trying to make is you need to accept this loss. You know, you need to grieve. You need to look at that. You need yes. to say, well, I lost yes. it. You know, that's, that's you see what, what's happening. So now what? You know, what can I do after? So it's not yeah. like to live, to live in denial. You know, in order no. to rise, it's, it's kind of, no, no, I don't want to look at that. I, I'm holding, holding, holding. It's kind of opening something, like kind of being open, broken heart, and, and then to be able to say, all right, fuck you. Let's fight this- now. This is a great point because the first 10 years, that's what I did. I was really living in denial of the, I mean, I was acknowledging that this could happen, but I was in denial that I, that I would like not be in control after that, you know, like I was still trying to like affect change even after I potentially died. It was like the most pathological thing really when I think about that whole decade and how imminent death really affected my life. And then you're right, it it was really kind of like a, hey, I think it was an acceptance of, you know, okay, well, it looks like these guys, these experts are telling me that I'm going to die. I've decided now I have authority over my own life. And that's Mm -hmm. really what I talk about in that Survive Anything column that is becoming a book and will be actually a TED Talk in the future. So I'm excited about that. That's that idea of like really kind of just giving yourself the authority to say, this doesn't have to be the way that these people say it is, or the way that I think it's going to be, you know, just because you lose a job or you lose a house, all of those things, by the way, have happened to me. I've had losses, not just this loss, but that's why I write about survive anything, because I have actually survived quite a lot in a very short period of time. And that includes losses of homes and jobs, like big jobs that kind of like we're my life and then all of a sudden it's gone you just have to decide that that's not who you are who you are is outside of that house outside of that job outside of the cancer diagnosis outside of the labels people put on you because of your skin color or what you believe in it's just ridiculous humanity kills themselves you know i i often think i mean obviously cancer cells are cancer cells and there's nothing you can do about that, really, um, except change your diet and move more, whatever. There's preventative measures. But mm. ultimately, I think we have to live for ourselves. And that means saying to ourselves, hey, I can do whatever the fuck I want, whoever I want, whenever I want, anytime I want. And, and like, believe it, walk with confidence, walk tall you are like this collection of stardust really you know like it's incredible to think of what humans really are we're not just opposable thumbs and a complex brain put in these meat sacks i mean we're like legit interesting and and we are miracles actually if you look at all the other species on the planet we are completely different so you have to like appreciate that and live it you know live live that life of victory that you were kind of meant for now i sound like a preacher you know what stops everyone what stops everyone living that way i really think it has a lot to do with those social boxes we were talking about earlier Mm. before you're even born and i wrote about this the first the very first essay for survive anything is called beating the odds and it's really about understanding your social context So understanding that social box, your context, your background is that box before you're even born. I was just talking to my nephews about this. 
I have three like beloved nephews that I co-parented because their father actually died very tragically six years ago. And uh, so, you know, they kind of grew up in my house and we were having dinner on Sunday. And I said to them, the social boxes that were built for you before you were even born meant that when you were born, your mom, your dad were putting on these blue clothes, darker clothes, because you were boys. You were given footballs, you were given baseballs, baseball bats, baseball mitts, cocky things, sports things, you know, cars, trucks, because you were boys. Those are part of those social boxes. There's nothing wrong with it, but it does kind of inform who you are before you even have a chance to decide for yourself. So I think it takes people sometimes 40 or 50 years of life before they can have that sense of authority, before they can recognize those social contexts that are placed on them their whole lives. Like they're not even aware of it a lot of the time. Yeah. It's part of this evolution, I think. It's, it's how yes. do you, and in our book actually, because we have this book that we have finished on, which is called Dev Best Life Coach Ever. We don't talk about boxes, we talk about cages. You know, like we are oh. in this kind of cages, which is a construct that we put like our beliefs, you know, this is how we should act to free up of these cages is actually, how can we make die this persona, this persona that we create, that we need to be like this, we need to obey, we need to bat this, to, to die in order to be born, basically, and to, to right. be born in who we truly are. So we need to let go of something. We need to let go of all this thought. I don't know what you think about that. It's totally true, and you're right. It's, it's if anything that's based in our psychology, which all of this is, is is a thousand percent in evolution and evolution doesn't stop you know so right. here i am today at this point talking to you about my experience in five years i hope i'm even more <laughs> eccentric even more <laughs> out there and maybe i will be sharing like can you share the x-rated thing <laughs> at some stage please because we need to have more audience right that <laughs> <laughs> if we can say there's sexual content in this episode, that would help a lot, you know. That's it. The, no, ratings, uh, the ratings will go up. Sex, the ratings. And, sex and death, they both sell. Yeah. Well, you know, I can't share too much of my story because, of course, that's how I will be marketing and making some money in the future. No, I would say that if, you, if, if anybody out there watches porn, I'm a big fan of porn. And um, I don't care. I think it's a healthy thing to do. It helps you get over the top. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like the clip reel is fine, you know, the clip reel of old lovers or whatever. But it's still like, I can't quite get over the top. I need the visuals, you know, like right there. I'm like a man that way. I need some visuals. So if you like porn, pretty much use your imagination. And uh, I've, I've done it. <laughs> Let's let's talk actually uh, swiftly. Let's, let's change to because I, I wanted to talk, let's. I wanted to talk to you about about pop culture as well. You know. Oh, and okay, have, good. Yeah. And have you have your view about how pop culture treats that? How we consider death? Uh -huh. Because I think it's a kind of a hate loving relationship here with with death. You know. What 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 do you think? What is your thought about? It's that? really evolved. Actually, it's an interesting topic. Yes. It's it's evolved in the eighties. I forget the name of the movie and I apologize, but it was with Deborah Winger and she played a woman, a mother who had gotten cancer. And, and that was my frame of reference for when I got cancer. That's part of what drove my fear, actually, pop culture. And now, and now you like see death in a different way, being represented in a different way, similar to zombies, which, yeah. you know, kind of got humanized with, with Isaac Marion's, um, you know, sort of idea of zombies that have a heartbeat. That, that they can get turned on, you know, when he, when he wrote about um, Nicholas Holt was in, in that film. Uh, it was a great film, but it's a much better book, um, of course. I think that humans were the monsters sort of at the beginning of the 21st century and now, and so monsters had to be the heroes and now humans are, are, are reclaiming the hero role so we're treating death a little differently. You're seeing it in like superhero movies like Captain Marvel, which was out this year, where she died, but through death actually became this incredibly powerful being. Mm -hmm. And the same with Dark Phoenix, which just came out, um, which is part of the X-Men universe, the X-Verse. And same thing, through this kind of like death, she was reborn multiple times. We see it happen right. multiple times, which is realistic. Because in life, as we were saying, you lose jobs, 
you lose homes, you have all these little deaths, divorce, whatever, you, whatever happens to you, they're little deaths and you have to like reemerge like a phoenix in, in a, like a lot of ways. And that's, that was kind of my, um, I almost thought about getting a phoenix tattoo at one point. And yes, it would have been a total tramp stamp. I'm so glad I didn't do it now. <laughs> It was before they were calling them tramp stamps. I'm like, well, where can I put this like long thing? What, what about <laughs> what about your books about vampires? Because you also um, written two books about reality. I love the series True Blood a lot. You know, for me, what's one of my favorite show. Oh, and, True and, Blood, and, yeah. And, and it's so it's, good. it's a vampires and immortality. You mentioned zombies. You mentioned you know like so. Uh, what about that? What about this idea of suddenly about vampires being very cool? At the well, vampires are really, to me, I related a lot to vampires because if I hadn't gotten all these like bags of blood, nine bags of blood, I, I would be dead right now. It was during the cancer treatments oh. 18 years ago during the recurrence. I needed all this blood and I'm sitting there literally getting other people, like drinking other people's blood for <laughs> lack of a better term. And I'm like, you know, I'm like a vampire. And then I started to sort of, that was maybe part of the evolution. The vampire sort of figures large in my psyche in that way, because look at what they do. Uh, Dennis O'Hare, actually, that's one of the pictures I think I sent to you, is one of my clients I worked with through Comic-Con. He played Russell Edgington in True Blood, and he was brilliant as this 3,000-year-old vampire. And I loved his character, because that really is how you would be if you had if you didn't have the 100 year punch pass or whatever 75 to 100 year punch pass how would you how would you behave you know and i think that's mm -hmm. part of the evolution i've been going through because i you know i kind of feel a little immortal now obviously i'm not although i do have a fear i do fear that i could like attempt to kill myself let's say or try to kill myself and i would just become horribly injured i would like survive anything like now i feel like I can actually survive things that most people can't. And, and Jesus, I would like just be in a hospital bed for years. Like I couldn't even off myself the right way. You know, like I have this little bit of like kind of vampire-esque, you know, kind of psyche happening where I sort of feel like, geez, I'm not going to die unless somebody cuts my head off. I really wish people would live more like vampires in a way because the sense of, you know, morals that, that people have today are, are centered around these, again, these boxes. And this has got nothing to do with people's religion, but religion is, of course, a, a control, a method of control for people. I feel like a lot of their sen the sensibilities, the moral and ethical sensibilities that we have aren't based on our own fulfillment. They're based on someone else's ideas that somebody else gave to them that someone else gave to them again there are these boxes or cages as you call them i think it's just a cage and i think it really hurts us um, in terms of living our best lives so that's kind of what vampires free us from that those sensibilities because if you if you can live forever and unless somebody cuts your head off or stabs you in the chest with a stake then what do you have to lose? Zero. You can recreate yourself over and over and over again. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Again, please support the show by signing up at deathhangout.com or clicking on the subscribe button on your screen.